Question six, what could be the answer for question six? Just now we discussed uh, this part. The, the last session I was discussing the same idea. Large Hadron Collider is designed to extract proton at a very high energy for particle physics experiments. Why high energies are required? Yeah, C is the right answer because if you have more energy, that energy convert into mass so you can produce a greater mass. That's the reason why the top quark, which is the heaviest for each this quark combination, the top quark is discovered at the end, at the last. Reason for that, it's having more mass. So because we were not having particle accelerators initially in earlier like 19th century to produce these massive particles, that's why it took longer to discover this top quark as compared to other lighter quarks. In this question, the equation is for uh, positive beta, which is also called positron. Use the information in the table, describe how proton changes into neutron. <coughs> <coughs> so basically what happened, how the proton is changes into neutron What is a proton? Proton we know, proton is a common, it's a baryon, which is a combination of up, up and down. And it changes into neutron, so it just changes into up, down, down. So the basically the quark composition changes. This is a baryon, this is also a baryon, these are leptons, so lepton, the, Positron is there, so lepton number is for antiparticle minus one for particle plus one. So lepton number is conserved. What about baryon number? Baryon number is also conserved for each baryon, it's plus one. So both proton and neutron, they have plus one baryon number. So using an information, basically how a proton changes into neutron. So you'll mention a proton is a baryon, which consists of up, up and down. So the net charge is plus. It changes into neutron, which is also a baryon, and the composition changes into up, down, down. With reference to the charges of the particle, show that this decay is possible. So reference to the charges, the particle charge, because proton is positive, neutron is zero, electro, uh, positron is positive, the charges. So when I write the charge, proton is positive, neutron is zero, Positron is also positive and uh, here electron neutrino. That is uh, zero charge, so the charge is conserved. Before and after, the charge remain plus one, that shows the charge is conserved. So you can mention proton having a positive charge, neutron zero, uh, positron plus one and electron neutrino zero. So when we check the charge on left and right hand side, it is equal, shows that this reaction is possible in terms of conservation of charge. Next part, the kinetic, kinetic energy of a positron is 1.58 mega electron volt. 
it annihilate with a stationary electron two photons of equal energy are emitted calculate the wavelength of emitted photon the masses are given actually the advantage of having mass in mega electron volt per c square or giga electron volt per c square so we can identify this is the equivalent energy which is released so what happened the mention a positron which is having a this is example a positron and it is moving it annihilate with an electron with an electron stationary so electron is at rest where this was moving the positron the mass the rest mass rest mass here refers to like uh, it's not moving close to speed of light is mega electron volt per c square and for this one also 0.511 mega electron volt per c square and the kinetic energy is 1.58 mega electron volt that's a kinetic energy not c square so they collectively when they combine together the total energy like the mass which produce energy and the kinetic energy will be responsible for production of the photons and we have to calculate the wavelength of emitted photon so first we'll calculate the total energy how to get the total energy because when positron and electron annihilate each of them release energy 0.511 that's a energy released by uh, electron energy released by positron and 1.58 is a kinetic energy that, that's also contribute to production of that's why like in uh, new particle accelerators because we can accelerate the particle to a higher kinetic energy so this factor increases that's why we are able to produce massive particles so what is the total energy when you sum them you will get the total energy but that total energy will divide why because this total energy is producing for two photons so each photon the total energy divided by 2 you'll get energy of one photon and you will use the formula e is equals to hc over lambda to get the wavelength but the problem here is the unit because when i solve this like 0.51 plus 1.58 uh plus 0.51 again so when i calculate the ener this energy that energy is in electron volt mega electron volt so first using to use this formula e is equal to hc over lambda energy should be in joules so i will convert that energy into joules is it clear any doubt in this part in a linear particle accelerator or linear accelerator linex can produce electron energy up to 620 giga electron volt yes the mass of electron the advantage of this actually what is the advantage of representing the mass in this manner so that we know what is the equivalent energy release by this particle like if the mass was in kilogram the mass as we know the mass of electron is if the mass was given like 9.11 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg so first what you have to do you have to first find how much energy e is equals to mc square and then you will get energy but what is the advantage of this formula directly you will know the equivalent energy which it produce if this particle release energy or an highlight contribute or what fraction or what part of energy it contribute in annihilation so that's the advantage of mega electron volt per c square or giga electron volt per C square formula. In the next part, they're saying
the linear accelerator can produce an electron with energy up to 60 giga electron volt so this is the energy which is released about 60 giga -like electron volt calculate the de broglie's wavelength associated with 60 giga electron volt electron and add this ener add these energies the energy and the momentum of the particle are connected by equation e is equals to pc so what you can do you need a de broglie's wavelength so if e is equals to pc it means p the momentum is equals to e divided by c and the de broglie's as you took in the as lambda is equals to h over p so after getting the momentum and planck's constant you can find the wavelength okay next part experiment has been carried out where these 20 giga electron volt electrons are aimed at a hydrogen so there's a hydrogen hydrogen contain proton in the nucleus and electron is there around the nucleus suggest with the reason what happened to the path of electron so if we target a sample is there of hydrogen and we target this by a 60 giga electron volt electrons means high beam of electron is there so what we'll observe we'll observe a diffraction diffraction means like bending of the wave the as we know wave particle duality with this energy like 20 electron volt 20 giga electron volt there is associated wavelength as we worked out and when we find the wavelength that wavelength is approximately same as the order of the nucleus like the size of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 a 1 femtometer and this wavelength when we work out it will be in the same order so what we'll observe will not observe that electron as a particle what we observe we'll observe electron as a wave i'm drawing the wave front so when it is passing through a sample we'll observe a diffraction you can also mention because this is a wave particle duality so you can mention if this is a hydrogen nucleus an electron is revolving so due to electrostatic force the electron might deviate or change its path that's one thing you can mention or you can also mention if electron is acting like a wave then what and this wavelength is approximately equal to the size of the nucleus so what we'll observe we'll observe spreading of the wave we call that as diffraction is it clear this idea the diffraction so both possibilities are there there might be a diffraction or it might deviate from the original path This one is uh, January two thousand fifteen. The table gives the quark structure of the three particles. up quark has a charge of plus 2 by 3 down quark is minus 1 by 
कॉम्पोजिशन ऑफ अ न्यूट्रॉन इज गिवेन पाइन इज गिवेन एंड डेल्टा पार्टिकल इज देयर डेल्टा नेगेटिव पार्टिकल शो दैट अप डाउन डाउन इज अ पॉसिबल कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ अ क्वार्क ऑफ अ न्यूट्रॉन सो हाउ यू कैन शो इट्स अ पॉसिबल कॉम्बिनेशन वेन यू फाइंड अ नेट चार्ज as you will find the net charge because for up it is plus 2 by 3 plus 2 by 3 minus sorry up down down is there so plus 2 by 3 minus 1 by 3 and minus 1 by 3 i was doing for proton but it's minus 1 by 3 And minus one by three. So when you find the resultant or net charge, you'll find the net charge is zero. So it shows it can be a possible composition of neutron because the net charge of a neutron is zero. There is no charge on the neutron. The second part state in terms of quark structure why a delta negative is class as a baryon and pi minus is a meson so pi negative is a meson and delta so what's the reason because delta particle consist of three quarks whereas pi consist of two quarks and one of them is quark another one is anti quark so a simple reason you will mention three quark combination is known as a baryon so delta is because the delta particle is three quarks that's why it's known as a baryon whereas combination of quark and anti quark or you can mention two quarks and in this two quarks the condition is two quark combination but the condition is one should be quark another one should be anti that is refers to meson another particle in the delta family is a delta plus plus is also composed of up and or or down quark its decay is shown like there can be up or it can be down deduce the quark content of delta plus plus and the charge on the pi on so it is decaying its decay is shown it shows that a proton is released so how we can work out what will be the quark uh, the composition for delta plus plus and the charge so to work out the charge it's easy thing why it's simple because you already know there is one proton charge should be conserved so this should also be plus so we identify that charge should be plus now what about the quark composition so simply because it's plus 2 so the quark composition yeah it should be up up three up quarks because they mention it's in a same family so same family have a reference here that it same combinations are there same type of combination so this will be plus 2 by 3 this will be plus 2 by 3 and plus 2 by 3 so when you solve it will be plus 6 by 3 which is equals to plus 2 that's why the delta was having plus plus or plus 2 charge an electron is accelerated through a potential of 3000 volts calculate the de broglie's wavelength how to calculate first we'll get energy 
V is equal, and, uh, because voltage is inner, voltage is work done per unit charge or energy divided by charge. If you need energy, it's voltage multiplied by charge. Voltage is 3000 and the charge is electron 1.6 exponent minus 19. Coulomb, that's the charge, so we'll get energy. That will be in joules. After getting this energy, we have the formula E is equals to HC over lambda. So we have the energy, we worked out. We have the Planck constant, we know the speed of the light, so we can find the wavelength associated with this electron, which is accelerated by 3000 volt supply. So January 2014. And you can see here, the rest mass of a kion is given 494. So what you will do for that's equivalent energy will be there 494 mega electron volt. You will convert this mega electron volt first to electron volt, 494 into 10 to the power minus uh, 10 to the power uh, 6 electron volt, and then convert this electron volt into joules and divide by C square, you will get the energy. You will get the mass in kilogram. In 1962, the existence of the particle with strangeness minus three was predicted. Two years later, it was identified in an experiment involving an interaction of a proton and the K minus meson, which has a strangeness of minus one. A new particle was given the name Omega. The interaction which conserved the strangeness was Deduce with the re with deduce with reasons reasons so to the charges on the omega and whether it is a baryon or a meson. So we have to deduce this with the reason. What will be the charges of the omega? And then we have to predict whether it will be a meson or whether it will be a baryon. Like it will be a combination of two quarks or it might be a combination of three quarks. So for con first, to a, for a conservation of the charge, how we can uh, do a conservation of the charge, what, as you can see, this is negative, proton is positive. So net charge on the left-hand side is zero. K positive is there, K neutral is there. So what should be the charge of omega? It should be minus one. And then whether it's a baryon or a meson, as you can see, they mention that its strangeness is minus three. So if the particle strangeness is minus three means it is a combination of three quarts. It is not combination of two quarts because if it was a meson, then it because meson, like example, strange and anti up is there. So, strangeness what is the strangeness of this particle? It will be minus one. But in this one question, they mentioned strangeness is minus three for the particle. 
So if strangeness is minus three, it means there should be three strange quarks in it. And if three quarks are there, what it could be? This particle can be baryon, it cannot be meson. This is one reason you can mention, or you can check the baryon number, conservation of the baryon number. Like if I check a baryon number, K are the meson. So this is a meson, meson baryon number is zero. For all mesons, any kind of meson, the baryon number is zero. Actually, what is the baryon number? For every, for each quark, the baryon number is plus one by three. And for anti-quark, the baryon number is minus one. So whenever you have a meson, meson is a combination of quark and anti-quark. So it is always meson, baryon number is always zero. So kaon is a meson, baryon number zero. Proton is a baryon, so baryon number will be plus one because it's a combination of up, up and down. So this is meson zero, meson zero. So what the, to, to have a baryon number conserved, so this should also be a baryon number plus one. So if something is having a baryon number plus one, so it cannot be meson, it is always a baryon. Is it clear? How we predict that this particle can be a baryon, not a meson? Then using the information, using the information given in the table, deduce the quark composition of each of the particle involved. Like we have to give a quark composition. What are what is this composition of a quark for K minus proton, omega, uh, K plus, and K neutral? The charge of omega is minus one because the conservation of the charge should be there as well. So what could be the quark composition for K minus? It's a meson. For a meson, I need quark and anti-quark. So how it can be a meson? Yeah, what could be the quark composition for K? K negative, it's a meson. We know, want a net charge to be minus one. And if you read the question, they already give you a hint. K minus is a meson, strangeness minus one. So if this particle is having a strangeness minus one, for strangeness to be minus one, there should be a strange particle in it, inside. But because it's a meson, so if there is a quark, there should be anti-quark. So for K minus, for K minus, strangeness minus one, so there should be strange particle. What else should be there with the strain so that I get a result minus one, the charge, because the charge should also be minus one. So if it's a strange particle, the charge is minus one by three. I need charge to be minus one. The net charge, it's more fraction minus one by three. So what I can have, I need minus two by three here. So which particle can have minus two by three? 
NT up because up is plus two by three. So NT up will be minus two by three. Then what is the composition of a proton? Proton is up, up and down. Plus two by three, plus two by three, minus one by three. So that will give us the composition of proton. Then K positive. Because they are in the same family, so it shows the similar type of composition should be there. Strangeness for every strange particle is minus one, and for anti strange, it is plus one. This is called a strangeness number. Up and anti strange, yeah, that's right. For this K, it will be up and anti strange. And for K neutral, what will be the composition of a K neutral? It will be down and anti strange. Yeah, the strangeness number for K positive will be plus one. Look, the reason, the reason why I, I was using a strangeness, because as they mentioned, existence with a strangeness minus three. So this particle is having a strangeness minus three. This particle strangeness minus one. So this should have a strangeness plus one. This should also have a strangeness minus, plus one so that the strangeness should be conserved. That is why I was using a strange particle in both K plus and K zero. Is it clear? This combination of the particle, how to work out the particle combination. In the question, they mentioned that this particle has a strangeness minus three and K minus a meson, which is strangeness minus one. Uh, because proton does not contain a strange particle, so its strangeness is zero. So these particles should have a strangeness plus one so that this reaction can occur. So here, and already they mentioned it's a strange, so for a strange minus one, so it contain a strange particle. This will contain anti-strange. Why anti-strange? Because in strangeness is plus one for anti-strange. Strangeness number. In another experiment involving a head-on collision between the two protons result in the following. A proton seven pi on, pi positive, seven pi negative, K positive, and another lambda particle is there. Calculate the minimum kinetic energy of each proton for this interaction. So basically there is a mass of the two protons and the kinetic energy of the two protons converted into the total mass of the particles which are required. So we need a kinetic energy. So look, for example, I will get the total energy of these particles, the total mass energy, which is equivalent to mass required to produce these particle. And I will know how much energy these two part protons can supply. So when I take the difference, I will know how much extra energy I have to supply to these proton to produce this combination. So 
simply what we have to do we have to find the total energy required for the product production of the product and we know total energy which is available from the reactant the two proton when we take the difference we will find how much energy kinetic energy is required for this interaction is it clear this so basically we can also say the total mass of the reactant plus kinetic energy of the reactant gives the total mass of the product so total mass of the reactant will sum them total mass of a product we add them and we subtract to get how much kinetic energy is required for production of this these uh, particles the interaction would not have taken place if one of the proton has been stationary and the other has a twice the calculated value what is the reason for that the interaction would not have taken place like if one of the proton is stationary and the, uh, like if i say if two protons are moving towards each other if the kinetic energy of this one is 20 joules example this is just an example the kinetic energy of this one is also 20 joule and the interaction occur it was producing the particles but if i do the same process that one of the proton is stationary and the other proton is moving with the same total energy which is 40 same as the initial one so what is the reason what might be a reason for this yeah what could be the possible reason here like this interaction will not take place if one of the proton is stationary and another proton has a twice the kinetic energy which we calculated the first case it was pr production of the particle second it does not happen the same interaction even though the energy is the same you can see 40 here also 20 plus 20 40 any idea so basically what is the reason look if the particle one is stationary and another one is moving so initial momentum of a system is not zero so final momentum should also it should not be zero so there will be a kinetic energy or energy used to move the other proton but here as the particles are moving in opposite direction initial momentum is zero so the final momentum will also be zero so energy is not used up for moving the particle or the kind all the kinetic energy is used to create a particle here not all of the kinetic energy is used to create the particles is it clear this idea